Well, dear Ricardo, thank you for invitation to present uh, this condensed uh, part for coronary artery disease here. So my topic is what I personally think is important to you as a general practicing cardiologist. Uh, what would you change when you come back from uh, this beautiful city home and how do you treat your patients probably differently? Well, I divided the talk in several parts. The new guidelines, coronary artery disease, new data for acute coronary syndrome, new data for stable coronary artery disease, and last but not least, one slide, maybe we have a new concept for drug treatment of these patients. Let's start with the new guidelines. Uh, we have four new guidelines. Two of those four new guidelines are actually addressing coronary artery disease. Uh, there is a focused update on DAPT, on dual antiplatelet therapy. Actually, it's not a real focused update because there is no update. There were, at least to my knowledge, never DAPT guidelines before. And uh, you should really read them. There are some new recommendations which are different from the previous ones. And for the sake of time, I will not read them all. Just at the bottom, you will see uh, Ticagrelor in low dose is recommended at least to think about it for secondary prevention. So this is new prolonged DAPT for secondary prevention, not for stent thrombosis, but for secondary prevention. What about the new STEMI guidelines? Uh, they have many new recommendations. At least we should focus more on lower H uh, LDL cholesterol with acetamide, with PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, in patients, this is for the interventional cardiologist with STEMI, in, at least in patients with uh, cardiogenic shock, go for complete revascularization if possible. And there are changes in recommendations. There is an upgrade of drug eluding stents, which were yellow, now they are green for STEMI. There is an upgrade for uh, other things. But there are also downgrades. Downgrades like thrombus aspiration, it went from yellow to red. Bival rooting got a downgrade from green to yellow, and even oxygen um, got a downgrade to avoid it at least with lower uh, saturation because oxygen may be detrimental. So not every patient with STEMI should automatically get oxygen. What about new data for acute coronary syndrome? So I picked some studies which I think uh, may be important to you. Um, Pre-treatment, yes or no. If you are an emerg emergency physician, if you drive the ambulances, do you have to do pre-treatment in STEMI patient, yes or no? And here are many patients, over 44,000 patients analyzed, and I just present to you the conclusion. It came out that pre-treatment of STEMI patients with P2Y12 antagonist was not associated with uh, increased risk of bleeding, <clears throat> but at least it was not very helpful. It did not improve 30 days survival and did not improve the patency of the infarct-related artery. So pre-treatment, yes, with aspirin, heparin, but not necessarily with a P2Y12 antagonist. Here's another study which shows very nicely that you can save money without harming the patients. Uh, usually a new study increases the cost, but this study showed and compared the relatively cheap heparin in patients with STEMI with the more expensive bivalrudin. And uh, many studies before were criticized because bivalrudin was not performed in the real world, in the real way you should do it. In this study, yes, it was done in a perfect way. And if you do it that way, there was no difference in primary endpoint, no difference in mortality, and no, even no difference in bleeding events. So the conclusion of that study was that there is no significance between the good old unfractured heparin and the modern expensive bubble routine. Again, you don't have to use it, save the money for other things. The next study I want to show you with ACS is tropical ACS, randomized trial with a design to what they call de-escalation of the P2Y12 inhibitors. Well, one group got the one-year Prezogrel as recommended by the guidelines. The other group was switched. After seven days after ACS, they switched to Clobidogrel, and after more seven days, PFT was done. PFT is platelet function test. If the patients were low responders, they were switched back to Prezogrel. If 
they were good responses to uh, clopidogrel, they were kept on clopidogrel. Well, the most important number, I think, which is practically important, is the very high number, to me, was surprising. 40% of the patients are low responders to clopidogrel. Well, this study showed a non-inferiority for the so-called de-escalation, primary, primarily driven by the reduced bleeding. Again, this is a what they called a strategic trial, not a pharmacological trial. I think it's impractical for us as practicing physicians to do platelet function tests after two weeks in our practice and then decide whether to switch back or to continue. So uh, actually, if you think back, this is not the first trial with this topic. Uh, this was done by the topic trial presented at the European CR in Paris in May this year with a similar switched versus unchanged DAPT protocol. And in that study, Ticagrelor was also used, not only Prasugrel. And they came about to the same conclusion. But again, the primary endpoint was driven by bleeding. So what is my recommendation to you? Let's have a look in the DAPT guidelines. And if you look in these guidelines, you will read that there is this approach is lacking and this strategy cannot be recommended at the present. So at the present time, I would not recommend you in the office if the patient is discharged and you see him after a couple of weeks, I would not recommend to you to switch. What about new data for stable coronary artery disease? I think the most important study was the redual PCI, but keep in mind, it's not only stable patients, half of the patients were stable and half of the other patients had acute coronary syndromes. This study addressed the problem of stenting of patients with atrial fibrillation, which usually require triple therapy. So this study tested the old triple therapy with a vitamin K antagonist plus aspirin plus P2 by 12 inhibitor and two different dual therapies without aspirin, dabigatran in two different dosages plus a P2 by 12 inhibitor. It was mostly clopidogrel, about 10 to 12 percent had ticagrelor. Well, here are the results for the primary endpoint. Not very surprising, of course, bleeding was reduced. If you take off aspirin, you have less bleeding. But the interesting question is, did the patient have a problem by having a new stent without aspirin? And the answer is no. These were the lucky results showing that for the ischemic and thrombotic endpoints, there was no difference between dual therapy and triple therapy. So the recommendation was to force or to use more dual therapy instead of triple therapy. Well, if you look at the other studies, we have now actually three studies uh, showing going in the same direction. The WUS trial, the Pioneer trial with Rivaroxaban, 15 milligram, which is not yet approved for this indication. And now we have redual PCI, even a little bit more patients here. Um, Dabigatran in two different dosages without aspirin. But Dabigatran is already approved for this indication. So when you go home and you have a patient on triple therapy, can you switch him to dual therapy? And the answer is yes. The new dual antiplatelet guidelines, and this is new, say that dual therapy with clopidogrel and oral anticoagulation, if you are afraid of major bleeding, and triple therapy is always a, should always be afraid of major bleeding, then you can go to dual therapy. If you look here at this new uh, schematic drawing, it is here on the right side that triple therapy is now to be omitted according to guidelines. So if you have a patient of triple therapy discharged by the hospital, you can call the interventional cardiologist and ask him, do we really have to uh, give aspirin? I'm afraid of having more bleeding. So you can, if he agrees, of course, with that, this take off the aspirin. Okay. There was another interesting to me uh, study comparing two stents, the BioFlow 5 study, testing the or zero ultra thin stent. Well, there were many studies before, but this is the, ma the major study with this stent is a very ultra thin stent, 60 micros, and this was compared to the so-called gold standard. I mean, uh, the Everolimus eluding, drug eluding stent is by many people called the gold standard. I personally never called it a gold standard, but some people do. So this actually is changing the gears because this new stent is 
actually superior to the so-called gold standard. So the question was, is there a new standard for drug eluding stent? So is it the stent or is it just because it's thinner? The Everolus eluding stent is 80 micros, this is 60 micros, maybe thread thickness and the stent design makes the difference. What about preventing cardiac cardiovascular events with CTP inhibitors? In this revealed trial, anacetropib was tested. Well, don't forget the history of CTP inhibitors is a sad one. One trial actually was stopped because it was detrimental to the patient. Two trials were stopped because it was ineffective. So we were very afraid to see the results of this trial. We also participated. We enrolled about 60 patients of these 13,000 patients. But we are afraid that this will also be a negative trial. And especially because, and this is incredible, the initial LDL cholesterol was 61 milligram per deciliter, even much lower than in the Fourier trial. What do you expect from a study where all the patients have a mean LDL cholesterol of 60 at the beginning of the studies? So if you wait two years, and this is important to show you, you have to really wait many years, then the two curves separate, and this is also significant. Well, 1%, you might say, 1% difference is not so much, but again, it is still positive with an initial LDL cholesterol of 60 milligram per deciliter. Well, this fits very well in these uh, curves. You are all aware of that. So the lower, the better is again proven. Uh, what about the PCS canine inhibitors? If you go very low with the LDL cholesterol in coronary disease, this is an interesting uh, figure here showing that in patients with an LDL cholesterol below 10, this is really like a baby, you know, below 10, you still can reduce cardiovascular effects without being afraid of the safety. So even neurological parameters were not different. So where is the lower border? So these authors suggested that you could really target considerably lower LDL cholesterol. Maybe the 70 MD per deciliter is an artificial border and you should go below 50, 40 or whatsoever. Well, this trial is really also probably changing the gear, the COMPASS trial, because these were very, very keen to do the study. In patients with stable cardiovascular disease, they looked whether rivaroxaban in a low dose plus aspirin is superior to aspirin. And these are the results. I was very surprised to see that by adding rivaroxaban low dose, two times 2.5 milligram per day to aspirin, the prognosis was improved. So there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular death, significant reduction in stroke. Well, myocardial infarction was not significant, but it is a new concept that combining antiplatelet with low dose anticoagulation improves prognosis in patients with stable coronary disease. What about bleeding? Yes, of course, bleeding was increased, but fatal bleeding was not increased. So you have to weigh the bleeding risk again versus ischemic risk, and when you go home next week or tomorrow, then you might ask yourself if you see those patients who are on aspirin monotherapy, should you add low dose rivaroxabine, 2 times 2.5 milligram to these patients. Well, last but not least, CANTOS. This is a really interesting study in patients with coronary disease. It was presented here, and the concept is, and the question was, is there a relationship between inflammation and coronary or atherogenic disease? Uh, this is the old discussion about how important is inflammation in the atherosclerotic process. And I was surprised that the study was performed. And here are the surprising results. After about one year, the two curves separate. Canakinumab, actually, was in, which is an interleukin antagonist, is available. It is approved, not for this indication, of course, but you can prescribe it. And after one year, the two curves separate. And this has nothing to do with LDL cholesterol. This is a reduction in elevated high sensitivity CRP. The inclusion criteria was above or equal to uh, milligrams per liter. And these patients actually have a benefit. And this is uh, incredible. It did not only decrease cardiovascular events, it also decreased fatal lung cancer. So this sounds like a miracle drug. Of course, nothing is for free. 
leukopenia was a side effect which is known for this drug and we need longer follow-up studies to exactly examine what leukopenia means to these patients. Well, and this brings me to the last slide, a new concept of drug treatment for coronary disease. Actually, we have three columns or three parts. The patient with high LDL, of course, we have to lower the LDL. Nobody knows what is the ideal lower border, maybe 50, maybe 30, maybe 20, we don't know, but the lower the better. Then we have the patient with the high thrombotic risk after stenting, after acute coronary syndrome, with all these antiplatelet drugs and antithrombotic anticoagulation drugs, which I've told you. But now we have probably a third column, which are patients with a residual inflammatory risk, and maybe we should consider in the future to add interleukin antagonists to the therapy of coronary artery disease. And hopefully next year at the ESC, we'll have more data on this interesting concept. And it is my pleasure, and I hope I will see you next year in my hometown in Munich at the ESC. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Yes, thank presentation.